This is going to be the first of several videos where we explore avian anatomy and physiology and we're going to start off by looking at the skeletal and muscular systems. As I mentioned previously, bones in birds are relatively lightweight, especially the long bones, because of the fact that they have a spongy interior with these internal struts. Now that serves two purposes. One, it makes the bones lighter but also it allows for the extension of the respiratory system through a series of what are called air sacs. Unfortunately, it also means that the bones are going to be um, a little bit more brittle, more likely to break, and if they do break and it messes up the integrity of the air sacs, that's one of the ways that a bird can die from something like a window strike. Now, birds that are flightless have evolved greater density in their bones, as you can see in this penguin here. It's not completely filled in because they still need that extension of the air sacs into these bones. The skeleton of birds is actually quite a dynamic series of structures where there's constant resorption and deposition of calcium and movement of calcium to different parts of the body as needed. So for example, during the breeding season, a female can sequester some of the calcium from her skeleton and place that into eggs uh, for, for egg development. And birds during migration, because of the extra wear and tear associated with the strong muscle contractions associated with the wings and the sternum, um, they can have added calcium deposits to strengthen those bones and in areas where the tendons are connecting the muscles to those uh, bones. There are other support structures associated with the skeleton in birds. The cartilage is an important series of tissues that provide some isolation between bones so that they don't rub against each other. Ligaments provide the ability of bones to be connected to each other and then as I mentioned tendons are the skeletal material that connects the bones uh, to the muscles. As I mentioned also previously birds don't have teeth. Their bills or beaks are toothless. Generally most of the ornithologists I know of refer to this structure as the bill but you can use either one. There is a solid bony support, both in the uh, upper bill and the lower bill. And we'll talk about the, what, which bones make up these parts of the bill in a minute. But overlying this is a vascular dermis that supports and produces an epidermis that becomes keratinized and, and it produces this tough, horny layer called the ramphotheca. There's a huge diversity of bill shapes and sizes in birds in this is associated with their diverse diets. So looking up here in A, we can talk about a crossbill, a finch that is adapted to foraging on green conifer cones. We'll talk more about this adaptation later. Uh, a spearing bill associated with something like an egret or a heron. A spoon-like bill in this uh, duck, this spoonbill. A meat-tearing bill like in this eagle. And then a, a seed crushing bill as you'd see in this cardinal. So when you see a bill that has a really broad base, that's an indication it's got a lot of muscles uh, attached to it and that provides a lot of crushing force and hopefully we'll be able to do some mist netting this semester and I'll catch a cardinal and I will let you uh, test that. So birds don't have teeth, but if you look at some birds, their ramphotheca has notches and grooves or serrations that give it a, a teeth-like function as you can see in this merganser here. Even within a general bill morphology in a foraging guild, so a foraging guild is a group of, of birds that have very similar diets but they can subdivide that resource in this case in large part because of different sizes and shapes of this charabriform bill shape. So we can talk about something like a curlew with a really long curved bill and ranging in different thicknesses and length to something like this um, little ringed plover here on the right. But this allows all of these to exist in the same habitat and reduces the amount of competition for food resources because they're going after slightly different invertebrate prey. Also, as I mentioned in the lab, there is a lack of clear sutures in the skull. There's a lot of fusion of the individual skull bones. Birds have a really large orbit, and this is associated with most of them having a really large eye. And to support this large eye, internally they have a ring structure called the sclerotic ring. This is something they also share with non-avian reptiles. As we'll see, birds don't have an external ear, but they do have an ear opening in the skull that leads to the middle ear and inner ear. 
And as I mentioned, the uh, bill is based off of a, a bony underlying support, and the top bill is generally referred to as the maxilla or the pre-maxilla. In this figure, it's, it's listed as a maxilla, but in, in a lot of others that I've seen, it's described as the pre-maxilla. And then the lower jaw is generally referred to as the dentary bone. Now, when, you, when you're talking about the bones, that's what these bones are called. But when you, when you see a bird in the field and it's flying around and you're describing, say, its bill color, oftentimes people will refer to the upper and lower mandibles. So that's, that's just one of the things that, that we do in ornithology. So I know it can be a little confusing, um, but, but the upper and lower mandibles is generally a field description of the bill that when we look at it anatomically, it's the premaxilla or maxilla is the upper mandible and the lower mandible is the dentary bone. So not only do bills vary in size, but they also vary in their ability to uh, uh, open with the premaxilla and the dentary independent by using this craniofacial hinge. This is uh, more obvious in some birds than others. So for example, parrots have a very well-developed craniofacial hinge that allows them to move their uh, upper mandible uh, independent of the lower mandible. And it's associated with the quadrate bone here rocking back and forth and pushing the upper mandible up or down. Another really cool thing that birds can do is show what is called rhynchokinesis. So rhynchokinesis is the ability of birds to take just the tip of their bills and move that independent of the base of the bill. Now this is going to be particularly important in birds like a curlew that has to reach way down deep into the sediment to uh, grab something. Can, just imagine that you stuck your arms all the way uh, buried into the sand. Someone buried your arms in the sand. You couldn't open your arms. There'd be too much resistance there. But you could probably wiggle the tips of your fingers, right? And that way you could grab something maybe at the bottom of that hole that you, your arms have been buried in. Well, that's exactly what these shorebirds with really long bills can do. It's called rhynchokinesis. Another bone that birds have that's associated with their foraging is the hyoid bone. So the hyoid bone is a floating bone in the throat that is, serves as the attachment source for the tongue. So it's this horned uh, hyoid bone and the base of the tongue attaches to it. Now that's really highly modified in something like a woodpecker is seen here. You see that there are these muscle sheaths around the hyoids and when they're relaxed, the tongue is withdrawn into the bird's body and it actually wraps around the head and even into the nostril. And that's because their tongues are incredibly long. And when they want to extend their tongue, what they do is they contract the muscles associated with these hyoid sheaths and that causes the tongue to protrude. Here's another diagram showing you the extent of the uh, hyoid mechanism in a woodpecker and comparing it to another bird like a parrot here. And notice it's a much smaller, um, very short, kind of pad-like tongue in something like a parrot. And here is a link to a website that gives you another demonstration of how the hyoid apparatus works. Ever wonder how a woodpecker can extend its tongue so far? Let's take a look at an animation I created. Notice the hyoid horns or bones. These articulated bones and cartilage are covered in muscle. When they are contracted, the tongue is extended, and when relaxed, the tongue is retracted. An adult northern flicker's hyoid horns connect in the right nostril. Here is a juvenile male hairy woodpecker using his long tongue to extract insects and their larvae from the bark. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the skull. Now let's move down the rest of the vertebral column. Leading from the skull, we have the cervical vertebra, and the number of cervical vertebra ranges uh, in different bird groups. And the greater the number, the greater the flexibility of the neck, but not really turning the head side to side, more like bending the uh, neck up and down. Then past the cervical vertebra, we have the 
fused thoracic vertebra, and this is going to represent a structure we'll talk about later called the notarium. And then we see a fusion of the sacral vertebra in a sin sacrum, and then a few separal, separate caudal vertebra, and then the fusion of the distal ones into a pygostyle. So I mentioned that the number of cervical vertebra doesn't uh, influence the rotation of the head in, around that axis. But think about something like an owl. An owl can turn its head a full 270 degrees. And this, I don't want you to memorize this uh, slide from a poster at a meeting. The, um, this image comes from uh, the, these individuals down here, so I, I'm giving them credit for, for that. Um, but what their study indicated was how is a, an organism like this owl going to turn its head without basically closing off its blood vessels or ripping them apart? So there's got to be greater flexibility. And sure enough, that's what they found, that there is greater length and flexibility associated with the extent of, of how these arteries stick out away from the cervical vertebra. And they actually have even these um, contractile uh, reservoirs that help to maintain blood flow uh, during high active movement of the head. So there are some really interesting modifications of the vertebra, but more associated with just making sure that innervation and blood flow uh, is, is consistent. Now, the turning of the head itself is associated with the ax modifications of the axis and the atlas, the first two cervical vertebra. All right. Um, Connected to the, and, and moving down the vertebral column, as I mentioned, the thoracic vertebra are fused into this structure called the notarium. Here we're looking down on the top of the notarium, and you can see the degree of fusion. And, and remember, a lot of this fusion that we're going to talk about in the skeleton, as I mentioned in lab, is associated with maintaining a nice rigid structure to resist the massive forces that are applied to the thoracic cavity when a bird um, is in powered flight. When it's contracting, doing the downstroke of flight, there's powerful muscle contractions, and all this fusion helps to make sure that the uh, thoracic cavity doesn't, uh, isn't crushed. Also at the front of the thoracic cavity is the furcula. As I mentioned in lab, the furcula is basically a, a fusion of the clavicles leading uh, past the thoracic verte vertebra we have the sacral vertebra, and they're fused into a structure, again, called the sin sacrum. Here you can see the high degree of fusion in the sin sacrum. So here we're looking down on the pelvic girdle, and we're looking here at the sin sacrum, and then we have the ilium up here and the ischium uh, down here, and the pubis would be, be below that. When you look at the thoracic cage itself, the vertebral ribs have these extensions from one rib to the other that again just allows a little bit more support for that thoracic cavity. These are referred, these extensions are called the uncinate processes. So here we have the pectoral girdle and um, the one of the more prominent bones here is the coracoid. Think about it as being this Greek uh, column that provides the greatest amount of, of support to keep the thoracic cavity to be being crushed during the powerful downstroke of flight because we're going to remember we're going to have this very large muscle attached here to the sternum and the keel of the sternum called the pectoralis uh, is going to be wrapping up to the base of the humerus up here which is going to be attaching in this uh, joint. Another muscle that is associated with uh, powered flight is an underlying muscle which is called the supracoracoideus, and we'll see that its tendon goes through this triosseal canal to wrap up on the other side of the humerus so that it can return the humerus back up into a starting position for another uh, power stroke. And as I mentioned previously, the furcula is composed of the two uh, clavicles. We're going to see that this is actually important, providing some spring-like action to help in respiration during flight of birds. We look at the wing itself. Again, the, the uh, basal bone is the humerus. So this would be attaching to the pelvic girdle. Then we see a substantial radius and ulna. The ulna, notice, has these bumps on it. Now the reason it does that is because this is where we see the attachment of the flight feathers, which we'll see later called the secondary. So again, remember I talked about how 
where there's a need for additional skeletal support, uh, you have muscle uh, calcium deposits, that's what these bumps are. As I mentioned in lab, we don't have uh, fully functional separate digits. Uh, we do have some vestigial digits, but for the most part, all of the hand bones are fused into this general region from here distally, which is called the manus, with the largest part of that called the carpometacarpus. So this is actually what produces the, the attachment for the feathers that are going to be important in flight for most birds. But not all birds fly, and so we see that some flightless birds have secondarily shown a uh, much more vestigial development uh, associated with their wing. So this is a kiwi. This is the wing of a kiwi circled up here in place. This is just the wing itself with its teeny tiny little uh, wing associated, wing feathers associated with it. Now there are claws seen in one species of bird, at least in juveniles, where they're still functional. So this is the Watsons. We've talked about Watsons uh, in the previous lecture. The juveniles can jump out of their nest if they're threatened by a predator, but they live in these swampy habitats, and so they can grab onto the vegetation, and they can crawl back up into uh, the vegetation for safety or back into the nest when the threat is passed. But they're really only functional in these juvenile Watsons. Um, you can see some very vestigial claws in, in uh, several other bird lineages, but uh, they're not functional in, in any of these. Now don't confuse claws, which are extensions of the um, ancestral phalanges, with spurs. Spurs are bony outgrowths that can uh, grow anywhere really on the bird, but they're oftentimes, well not oftentimes, they're, they're relatively rare, but they're seen in a diverse group of birds like cassowaries and this bird right here called a lapwing. And they are basically, yeah, just uh, a bony extensions uh, sticking out. And they're oftentimes used in male-male competition, um, like seen in this lapwing, and then in the legs of chickens and other galliforms. All right, I already mentioned the sensacrum, which is the fusion of the sacral vertebra. Also making the pelvic girdle, however, um, is the, the ilium, the uh, forward-facing part, the ischium, and then this long skinny pubis. But the pelvic girdle itself is relatively open, so it's kind of this dish-shaped structure on top of the bird, very open underneath, and this allows for females to more easily lay relatively large eggs. Moving on to legs and feet. Um, as I mentioned in the lab, birds do have a femur, and that's at the, the distal part of that is where the knee joint is. But you generally don't see this because it's tucked up underneath the body, right? So in, in, in kind of where the feathers are in the body. Most of what you see as far as the leg of a bird is associated with the tibiotarsus, a relatively longer bone, and the tarsometatarsus. Okay, that's what these two bones are right here. The tibiotarsus also has a, a attachment to it, a very uh, slender, basically vestigial fibula. But notice that the tibiotarsus and the tarsometatarsus are approximately the same size, so that when this ankle joint back here, which some people think is just a backward bending knee, but that's the ankle joint, when that bends down, it allows the bird to maintain a nice center of gravity so like if a female was going to uh, sit on a clutch of eggs so that she doesn't topple over. There are some interesting modifications of toes. We talked about different toe patterns uh, in birds in the lab as far as, you know, anisodactyl and heterodactyl and zygodactyl feet and different webbing patterns or, or uh, lobate patterns. Um, but another modification is some birds have what are called pectinate claws. Pectinate means comb. And so these are basically little combs that they can use when preening. So they can scratch through their feathers to get rid of parasites and debris. And we'll talk about the importance of this uh, because birds spend a lot of time taking care of their feathers. Now let's move on briefly to talk about the muscular system. I'm not going to say too much. Um, birds have skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscles, uh, like most vertebrates. The skeletal muscles can vary in the percentage of white versus red muscle fibers depending on the typical function of those muscles. 
So, for example, if in a cursorial bird, one that's running all the time, it's going to need those muscles not to tire out too fast. And so it's going to have more red muscle fibers in the legs. They don't fly very much, and so their breast muscles, their pectoralis muscle, is going to be primarily associated with white muscle uh, fibers. So think about when you order chicken. Now contrast that to something like a, a warbler that's going to be migrating uh, hundreds or thousands of miles from a wintering range to a breeding range. It has to have very long, consistent contractions of these muscles, and so they're going to more likely have a lot of red muscle fibers in their uh, pectoralis muscles, but their legs, they don't use them that often for long periods of time, and so they're more likely to have white muscle fibers in their legs. Smooth muscle is associated with uh, what just you've learned in other vertebrate groups, uh, typically associated with things like uh, glands and uh, the digestive tract. Cardiac muscle clearly is associated with uh, the heart. Now, one of the things we'll talk about in a lot more detail, and I've already mentioned it several times, is uh, the flight muscles. So the important flight muscles that are attaching to the sternum that allow birds to have powered flight. The biggest one of these is called the pectoralis. So the pectoralis is more superficial, and lying underneath it is a, a supracoracoideus. And in most, most birds, the pectoralis is much the larger of these muscles because it provides, as you can see here, as it contracts, it's going to pull down that humerus. That's the powerful downstroke uh, during flight. What the supracoracoideus does underneath, as you can see, the uh, tendon of it wraps around through that triosseal canal. And what it does is it, it, it lifts the wing back up in the return stroke. So it doesn't need to be nearly as powerful until so it's a relatively small muscle in most birds, except, interesting as we'll see, hummingbirds is about equal size because they have a very interesting, more uh, figure eight type beating of their wings where they use both of these muscles in a, a, approximately the same manner. So that's it for this lecture. The next lecture will uh, focus on the digestive tract in birds.